Hello everyone and welcome to the second episode of Jami Talks, a podcast that's created for the eco-curious, for the earth conscious and the sustainability enthusiast. Since we launched Jami in January, we decided to have these conversations and have each episode focus on one topic and looking at that topic through the eyes of an expert in the field or a leader on the field. We also intend to show great work that's happening on the ground, being done by people we refer to as Jami heroes, really showing the resilience and who we are as Africans. So if you're looking to get motivated, if you're looking maybe to start creating the change that you want to see, then you're in the right place. So I'm your host, Patricia Obozwa, Vice President, Public Affairs, Communications and Sustainability for Coca-Cola in Africa. For those who missed it, the first episode featured B. Perez, who's Coca-Cola's Chief Sustainability communications and strategic partnerships officer. She talked about Coca-Cola's work in sustainability, really highlighting the important strategies that we've developed globally and showing Africa's role in delivering on those strategies. How do we not just refresh the world, but how do we also make a difference through the business that we have, through, through Coca-Cola and through our people? So what I would say is that the continent of Africa plays a critical role in reaching the overall global goals for the company in the environmental, social, and governance space. And when we think of sustainability, we start with the core business, what's important to the business and where can we make a meaningful difference? What do the stakeholders and communities care about? And so when we start with mapping that out into these quadrants of what difference can we credibly make, that's where we look at how can we also drive scale throughout the world as we set these goals and targets. It's gonna be a great episode. It's gonna be a great episode because today we're gonna to focus on partnerships. We believe that when it comes to sustainability, going it alone is a total waste of time the impact is so much stronger when you go with partners so that in mind today i'll be talking to a very important partner wwf we'll be talking with the chief executive officer dr monet duplessis thanks for joining us. Monet is the chair of the Academic Advisory Board of the Stellenbosch Institute of Advanced Studies. He's also a member of several trusts and advisory boards. He held research and management positions at the former Natal Parks Board and the University of California at Berkeley. Before joining WWF in South Africa, which he joined in 2007, One was the director of one of the six national centers of excellence in South Africa at the Percy Fitzpatrick Institute of the University of Cape Town. He has presented several keynote lectures and scientific presentations at a wide range of local and international conferences and authored and co-authored over 50 scientific publications in the fields of conservation biology and environmental science. He was awarded the South African National Research Foundation's President's Award in 1996. In 2000, he was listed among the Mail and Guardian's most promising 100 young South Africans in the new uh, millennium. So, without further description, although there's a lot more that I could say, welcome to Jimmy Talks. Thank you very much, uh, Patricia. And thank you for your time. We're thrilled that you're actually hosting us here in the WWF um, offices. So, for more than a decade, we've worked as partners in uh, supporting healthy natural water sources. I think my first question to you would be, what is the biggest challenge that the continent is facing 
on water. What are your views around water sustainability in Africa? Uh, well, I mean, that's, that's a very important question because, uh, you know, water is the, is the blood of life. And uh, in, in Africa, as everywhere else, uh, humans need clean drinking water. We also need water for sanitation purposes. And uh, that is, of course, what makes it so, so very important. The challenges in Africa are, are vast. So about one in four Africans don't have access to clean drinking water or sanitation, water for sanitation. So that, in the first instance, is a, is a massive problem, the, the pure issue of access. When we look at water sources and the way in which we've gone about um, maybe neglecting uh, our, our uh, river systems and, and, and wetland systems, uh, the big pressures that are placed on these systems through degradation and often degradation happens in a way where economic activity takes place uh, and there isn't full cost accounting of that economic activity. So the costs uh, on nature, the costs on those river systems, on those freshwater systems are externalized. They're not built into the economic viability of a particular venture. There are all sorts of mitigation measures that can be put in place. You know, humans are resourceful. Um, technologies and, 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 and intellectual uh, capabilities to, to work our way out of these. But often, uh, particularly in the African context, um, there isn't proper follow through. So degradation of water basins, of, of catchments, as we call them here in South Africa, uh, a very, very significant um, uh, issue. Then, uh, you know, alien clearing infestations, uh, invasive alien uh, trees, uh, for example, that soak up uh, a lot of the, uh, the water out of the systems. Very, very important. And of course, also playing a part in degrading uh, those systems. Uh, then, you know, things like inappropriate uh, infrastructure development buildings uh, in wetland systems, uh, crops being planted through wetlands, um, you know, just general degradation through human activity, which is seen as important and normal, but not taking into account the ultimate consequences of those actions. So thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. And let me build on them by talking a little bit about um, Coca-Cola's 2030 water strategy. So that's focused on three areas. The first is regenerative operations at our factories. And the second piece it focuses on is um, helping to promote climate resilience in communities by providing access to water. So people are more able to deal with um, the effects of um, climate change. But the third, which is a lot of the work that we've done with the WWF, is really contributing to um, healthy watersheds. So protecting and, um, and um, repairing uh, natural water sources, such as projects that you mentioned around um, alien invasive um, uh, plants around um, the water sources. Thanks for your partnership. I mean, what can I say? But the next question I'd like to ask is now moving into another area of the environment. Now, WWF has been playing a leading role in helping tackle the plastic waste crisis that exists around the world. And um, your initiative, No Plastic in Nature, has been a very important one to help tackle this crisis. Can you expand a little bit, talk a little bit about that initiatives, um, initiative and how um, the challenges you faced, what you've learned, just as much as you can share? Yeah, so, so thank you. Um, no Plastics in Nature is a global WWF network initiative. It uh, takes the approach that you know, when you walk into your house and your floor is covered in a foot of water, you, um, you don't go for a bucket and start scooping the water out the window. You try and uh, locate the source. 
and uh, turn off the tap or you know fix the the hole in your pipe so uh, and it's the same uh, pla no plastics in nature takes that approach of saying let's look at the whole system and move as far upstream as possible in order to to tackle the problem so it doesn't mean that a bucket is not going to help you when the time is right but there's a sequencing and so it takes this holistic approach where first of all it uh, looks at uh, improving the global governance system around um, plastics and in particular working towards the establishment of a global treaty on plastics and let me just remind you uh, if I say the word CFCs the chlorofluorocarbons you know that yeah. sort of gassy stuff that comes out of fridges and yes. air cons yes these, these were in the 80s a massive problem because they were busy destroying the ozone. You, you know, this is language we've almost forgotten. So the ozone, these holes were appearing on the poles and particularly in the southern pole. And um, this was really threatening humanity. So what happened was that a global treaty was established called the Montreal Protocol. And by getting all nations into binding commitments, we've managed to turn that around. So the ozone problem and CFCs are no longer threatening us as humanity. And this is, I think, the context in which we need to see the plastics pollution problem as well. We can solve it. We've got to get together. And so first step is that global treaty. Then the second thing is that one has to look at how uh, plastic is consumed and uh, also in terms of the production of plastic looking at uh, innovation and ways you know we can't wish plastics away entirely there are certain types of plastics that we've got to get rid of the single-use plastics no room for those to be used but then you know you can think of medical applications you can think of food uh, preservation etc to extend the shelf life of foods these are all important things. So, so um, we've just got to keep innovating around that. And then the third issue is around making sure that collection of plastic uh, is best enabled. And so that there's an end of life solution also for plastic when it gets to that. So end of life meaning either it gets returned into a cycle um, and, 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 you know, uh, Coca-Cola has uh, made significant commitments in terms of uh, uh, using recycled plastics. I think you can give us those statistics. But uh, certainly there are those commitments that have been made. And then there are plastics that l reach end of life and there needs to be a solution for that. Otherwise, you and I are going to walk around, our, our children and grandchildren will walk around with a significant amount of plastic inside our bodies as part of our tissue. And we certainly don't want that. Right. Thanks for, you know, painting a picture in, in a way that anyone can understand just how big this crisis is. Coca-Cola has made some pretty big commitments. So the big one is um, World Without Waste. And it, on that one, we're recognizing our responsibility as being one of the world's biggest beverage producers, knowing that we have a responsibility to also lead the industry in terms of how to tackle um, plastic waste. So the commitment that we made is to collect and recycle a bottle or can for everyone that we sell by 2030. And obviously when you make such a big commitment, you then make, you know, you put other steps in the middle of the way to ensure that you're working hard to reach that target. So some of the other things that we, we committed to uh, are things like using 50% uh, recycled material in all of our PET production by 2030 and making sure by 2025 that 100% of all PET that we produce, all plastic um, packaging that we use is recyclable. Yeah, to make those commitments is, is, is a very, very big step to follow through and delivering on them. 
is massive. And, uh, you know, it's, it's companies like Coca-Cola and, and others who make these public commitments who who compelled to, to deliver on those. And, uh, and, and, and that's very, very heartwarming for us. Here in South Africa, uh, specifically, WWF has uh, launched the South African Plastics Pact, which brings together uh, different role players from industry uh, to make uh, commitments also in the vein that uh, the same vein as, as Coca-Cola has made commitments. Uh, we have a very, very uh, good and trusted relationship with uh, uh, waste reclaimers. So waste pickers are pretty much bureaus in their own right. You know, these are often people from the very poorest of the poor who collect and gather uh, large volumes of, of plastic waste that can be recycled and bring them to recycling centers. And, uh, you know, in Johannesburg, if you, if you look around, you see waste pickers at work from dawn to dusk. Um, it's a, a very hard life, but they play a massive role also in turning that engine, that part of the engine. We've got to do everything possible to also make um, uh, opportunities and life better for them. Absolutely, because it's got to... It's got to provide a living um, income, otherwise nobody's going to be incentivized to collect the plastic waste. So that's a very important piece of work that you're doing there. As you know, the Coca-Cola company renewed its partnership with WWF globally for another three years. This happened um, last year, tw uh, 2021. And uh, it's been a partnership for 14 years now. What are your views on what that partnership has uh, made possible, what, how it's accelerated um, this great work that you do, and especially um, the work that we're doing in uh, South Africa. I mean, from our end, obviously, it just shows the value of bringing um, two different two organizations that are coming from different sides or um, to the table and having those organizations work collaboratively for common good. And the fact that we can do that with us from the private sector, Coca-Cola, um, the Coca-Cola Foundation and WWF from the nonprofit sector really focused on the environment, coming together in that kind of way for us has really shown that partnership can bring about much stronger impact over and over and over again if we've done this for 14 years. So let me turn it back to you to tell us um, about the WWF side of things. Look, uh, this partnership has been uh, phenomenal. It's been, it's been a, a leading partnership in the sense that it started 14 years ago at a time when the issues that we're talking about weren't quite as fashionable as they are now. So a uh, great foresight uh, 14 years ago or 15 years ago now. Uh, and globally, Coca-Cola has um, uh, supported WWF in working in 50 different countries. Now, South Africa is only one of those. And I'll tell you a little bit about the work that we have done and the work that we plan to do uh, with, uh, in this partnership with Coca-Cola. But first of all, uh, you know, the work has been largely around um, increasing and, and um, replenishing freshwater sources, um, uh, very, very obvious initial focus, and has um, graduated now to the point where climate resilience is a, is a key issue. And with climate resilience, we're talking about how communities respond in their livelihoods to, to the effects of climate change, mediated by freshwater availability. Uh, but um, yes, we're also um, looking then uh, at uh, clearing uh, in, in the South African context, uh, going into the strategic water source areas of South Africa. Now the strategic water source areas are those areas that receive collectively 50% of our rainfall and 10% uh, of our land surface area receives 50% of our rainfall in South Africa. So they're areas of disproportionate importance 
for freshwater um, runoff. And, and that's where WWF in South Africa is focusing. There are 22 clearly defined strategic water source areas. And because we always try and bite off much more than we can chew, uh, we started off thinking that we could get busy in 22 water source areas, but physically that is just uh, proven to be impossible. So we focus on 11 of the 22 strategic water source areas in South Africa. And uh, we go about with the support of the likes of Coca-Cola in uh, bringing to communities the possibility of creating jobs uh, by um, uh, clearing invasive alien trees out of catchments, thus releasing more fresh water into those systems. And those can be uh, easily quantified. Uh, we know uh, the um, uh, potential for these large um, eucalyptus and pine trees generally uh, for sucking up water from these river systems. And then uh, when we remove those, we can calculate how much water is released back into the system as a result of that clearing. So that creates both an ecological benefit, it creates a social benefit through the creation of job opportunities that uh, that are undertaken by uh, people from those communities. And then we also looking, of course, when you clear, at, uh, when you fell a tree, an alien tree that should not be in that system, then you're sitting with a biomass, the wood biomass that is then dropped onto the floor. And some of the work that we propose to do and are busy with, with the Coca-Cola Foundation funding, is um, to create business opportunities through using that biomass. So it's either through um, chipping, uh, um, putting chippers in place in order to chew up that, uh, those trees and, and spitting them out in what can be used as mulch in, 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 in growing crops and agriculture, vegetables, etc., to keep your soils moist or that mulch is used for the um, creation of charcoal. So um, we, we're driving quite a lot of other small uh, business opportunities um, in, in making use. So there's a whole um, supply chain around the, the, the clearing of invasive aliens. The other things that we do um, relate to working with communities in order to train them in ecologically wise uh, fire management. So in a lot of the grassland systems that, that we work, uh, fire is a, is a very big driver of, of, of change in those systems. Uh, fire is not necessarily a bad thing, but fire can also be too frequent. And in order to contain those big fires through the large grassland landscapes, you need to do block burns. And those aren't easy to do. So we train community members in, in, in acquiring those skills so they can also then build small businesses that in turn can do a lot of the fire management for neighboring uh, forestry companies, uh, neighboring agricultural farmers, etc. And then finally, um, what also comes out of building this resilience uh, in these communities uh, relates to the fact that um, we improve uh, the um, grazing systems by working very closely with communities to make sure that their cattle and their goats and sheep are moved around in a way that provides the best opportunity possible for those animals to grow fat and to be marketable. And at the same time with other partners, um, other NGO partners and commercial partners, we bring in mobile auctions to the people in the rural areas so that they don't have to uh, transport their animals to auctions to be sold in big centers, uh, but the, 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 the buyers actually come to them. And this has proven to be a very, very um, interesting um, driver of economic activity. And, um, you know, the areas that we work in include uh, the Nkangala area um, recently, we had the privilege to visit there together yeah. at a, a place called Mkondo or Petra Tif as it used to be known. So um, with the community there, 
a great need in that community and um, and certainly we were able to witness firsthand just how much it means to them to be able to have this opportunity to um, uh, benefit from the partnership between WWF and Coca-Cola. Well, that is wonderful, Monet. It's, it, it's just great to see the effect that the work that you're doing has. So on the one hand, you are focusing on the environment, making sure that we um, take care of those water sources. But on the other hand, just like Jami, you're moving into economic empowerment of the people in those communities. So basically, bringing about a better future for Indeed. those communities, not just for nature, but for the people as well. That's just wonderful work. Thank you for sharing that. Now, Monet, let's move into your personal life. I bet you didn't think we'll go there in this <laughs> interview. So I am informed that you're an ardent hiker. Luckily, you live in Cape Town. I'm also told that you're an expert on birds. What made you take up these passions? These are fascinating things to do. Well, you know, you'd expect somebody who works for uh, WWF perhaps to have an interest in nature. My, my interests go far back. I grew up in the rural part of South Africa, the Eastern Cape. And I was surrounded by, um, you know, a diversity of bird life that, that fascinated me from when I was a kid. So, so that's how I got into birds. But I want to tell you that when I moved to Cape Town, some years ago, I moved into the epicenter of plant diversity. You know, the, the, the Cape Floristic Kingdom, as, as this area is known, is the smallest of the plant kingdoms. There are only six of them across the world that cover every square inch of land. And this is the tiniest. Within 100, 150 kilometers of Cape Town, you get to the edge of it. So it sits only inside the southwestern corner of South Africa. And it's had this massive explosion of diversity of, of um, you know, plants um, disproportionately uh, diverse. 9,000 species in this little corner of plants and 70% uh, of them occur only in this area, nowhere else in the world. Oh. So it's very, very unique. So it was a little bit like living next to um, Maradona and watching 10 pin bowling on the on the TV, you know, so I switched to soccer, I switched to the big thing in the Western Cape. And so that's where my hiking comes from. I walk 30, 40 kilometers in the mountains uh, at a time from dawn to dusk, uh, looking for interesting flowering plants. And that in a way, as my wife says, has become and not just my pastime, but my obsession. And I learn every day. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> a, you, you, I, I knew that there would be a reason for the passion, obviously, to even lead the WWF organization, you have to be interested in nature. But to hear you link the hiking with the plant species in Cape Town is just wonderful to hear. So thanks for sharing that probably all we're going to ask you about your personal life. It's been a pleasure having you as the second guest on the second episode, well, the guest on the second episode of Jami Talks. Thank you for making the time to do this. Thank you. Jami is about coming together for positive impact in Africa. Jami is about having that dialogue that tackles the challenges that we face in Africa and starts to look at ways that we can solve these issues. But the very important thing, maybe the most important, is Jami's focus on partnerships. Partnerships that help create a better shared future for Africa. So thank you. Thank you very much, Monet for joining us on this. I look forward to the next two years of this journey on Jami, where we continue to refresh the world and make a difference, as is the purpose of Coca-Cola. WWF, as I've said earlier, really appreciates the opportunity to work with Coca-Cola. We share similar values. We work towards a common purpose. 
And as uh, we often say in conservation, without uh, financial support, uh, conservation remains conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good one. Thank you for joining and see you next time.